Hello Jim, after winning the Grand Prix Prize at the 2018 Deauville American Film Festival, you are back to present your new movie, The Beta Test, co-directed and co-written with PGM Cabe. This is one is also your fourth movie after No Flood Way Here, Thunder Road and The War for Snow Arrow. All are very excellent. How do you feel to be back in Deauville? It feels amazing to be back in Deauville. It is a home away from home a bit. It was nice to see the whole team and it feels so shocking that it was four years ago, the last time I was here. And to think that, you know, I've made two movies since and that they're celebrating this one is really unbelievable. It feels like, yeah, coming home to roost. <laughs> In a few words, can you talk a little about the story of this movie? Yeah, sure. So, the beta test is about a Hollywood agent who is engaged to be married and he gets a letter in the mail inviting him to a no-strings-attached sexual encounter in a hotel room and he goes and it's wonderful but then he never gets another letter and it starts to drive him crazy and so it's about him going down the rabbit hole trying to find out who you know sent the letter to him it's a bit like Chinatown but it's a comedy and it also gets very scary so it's a bit of a horror movie too how have you shared the writing and the direction of this movie with PJ McCabe? Yeah, it was really great to work with PJ. So PJ and I were friends in college and then started working together after college. He was an actor, I was a filmmaker, and so we were always working in each other's stuff. PJ was acting in some of my early short films and stuff, and it just happened very naturally, where the way that we write movies is all out loud. So it's a bit like this, where we'll set up a camera or a, a recorder and we'll act out scenes a thousand times and then find the best dialogue and then write it down. So really, PJ and I were already co-writing the movie just by rehearsing it. And then in doing that, we were just so close to directing it because every word matters in our movies. And so it was like, all right, well, shit, why don't we just co-direct this one too? And he had never made a short film before. This is his first feature film. So he jumped immediately into features. Um, but he fucking killed it, and it was great. We got to have like thousands of conversations about what would make the movie better and more perfect, and not just like a normal writing relationship where someone's trying to make it different but not better. It was really unique and really wonderful. I want to do it again. Which resources have you done, and which are your main sources of inspiration? Some movies, some books to create it. We think about the Twitter zone and Alpha Discord Twitter in you know, seeing your movie. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So um, it is a bit like a Twilight Zone episode, uh, or like a Black Mirror episode. Yeah. It's a very simple story about what would happen if you gave in to temptation. And so I feel like it's a bit of a, a natural thing. It's like a universal thing of guys being tempted to sleep with someone who isn't their wife. Uh, but it's, uh, I think the biggest inspirations were probably Eyes Wide Shut. I liked that movie a lot, same themes. Mm -hmm. Ours is a comedy version of Eyes Wide Shut. And then Blue Ruin, uh, I really like that film just because it like, becomes very violent and the stakes are very high uh, during some of these moments, which I love. I love feeling that anxiety. Um, Rear Window as well, it's about like, you know, uh, just the small social implications and breaking the rules a bit and tension and in a neighborhood. Um, and then Parasite, Parasite was a huge inspiration to, um, to make something that was that well crafted and scary and funny at the same time. What can you tell us about your filming locations and which impact had the COVID-19 pandemic on the shooting of this movie? So, we shot the movie in November and December of 2019. Okay. So we completely dodged COVID, <laughs> which we were, oh, we were so fucking lucky. So like, yes. legitimately, the, one of the schedules was such that we would shoot the movie in March. Yeah. And I'm obviously so fucking glad that we did it. And instead, we shot uh, The Wolf of Snow Hollow in March of 2019. And then by November, or October, we were shooting this new movie. So it was like two movies in one year and a bit of overlap in like post-production and then production. Um, but it was, we were very lucky and um, there were moments that I had to get, like there's a shot in the movie of PJ using his phone and then I do a 360 around him and he would get tested and come and help to edit the movie for a week at a time and we would get these small shots on cameras like this and it blends into the movie pretty well. What can you tell us about the distribution strategy for this film? Yeah, so we had saved enough budget from the financing campaign that we ran to potentially self-distribute. We didn't want to be backed into a corner. We had this other opportunity to self-distribute. 
and very quickly we realized we weren't going to do that because IFC Films in the United States loved the movie and Ariana Boca and her team championed the movie, they, had a, they, they understood it, they had the same sense of humor as the movie and us, uh, we're very lucky. And so very quickly we realized that they were the people that were good. They were us. It was the same team, basically. And so I have loved all of their movies, Itamama Tambien, In the Loop, Death of Stalin. So many of their movies have been huge inspirations to me that they bought the movie for the United States. And then we reached out to New Story and a few other uh, distributors around the world and have been able to have this global release in a way that, you know, we kind of had to do it on our own for our previous films. And so it's been really nice to partner with people that have a good sense of humor. What should be for you the main duties of an agent? What do you think about the battle between the WGA and the agencies? Yeah, so, yeah. Agents are having less and less utility um, because of the internet. Because if you wanted to, yeah. you could reach out to me on Twitter and say, hey, I have this project. <laughs> yes. So there, so there is less uh, borders to be able to get in touch with people. Yes. And actually, the agencies were started as this social network, almost, to be able to connect people. Mm -hmm. And now that we have real, functional, free social networks, there's, they're having less utility. Um, I think the WGA put up one of the best fights in history. Uh, they won. They were able to make these people that seemed powerful, who wear suits like this and are angry and assholes to everybody, um, Kauto and uh, bend the knee to the creatives. I think it was one of the most important fights in Hollywood history, and it happened over the last three years, four years, um, and they didn't have to put up the fight, but because they did and because they won, the industry will not become awful, like the Death Star in yeah. Star Wars, you know, and I think nice. that we were really on the precipice of losing this big battle, and we didn't. You have produced, written, directed, and edited, and you play on your movies. Which is your favorite part? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, my favorite part of making my movies is... I hate to say it, I love editing and putting in sound design that helps to make a joke work, yeah. and that's always fun. But I can do that for other people's movies. My favorite part of making the movies is being on set and doing the writing, directing, and acting, because I have such a team of people that I love that at any given time, we can, we'll do a shot, I'll race back over and watch the monitor and hit playback, and it's just my friends in this little video village, and I can put my arm around any of them, and it feels like summer camp. It's this incredibly vibrant feeling, and um, it feels like living. It feels like the most alive that I can be. And so I hate to say it, it is all three of them, writing, acting, and directing. It just happens to be on set. Nice. Your film seems to alternate long text with montage. How do you think the good rate for this movie? Yeah. So that's, that's new to me. So for the last few films, I've only done, uh, for, for Thunder Road, it was almost just long takes. So it's like these really yes. long take scenes for things. And then I just forgot that editing is an art form and like that you can do editing tastefully and make a good movie. And so really the beta test was just, was that for me. It was me uh, realizing that you could tell the story and it would be better by having it told like this and feel a lot more suave and like, um, premium in a way that Hollywood people would watch the film because it has this slick feeling to it. Yeah. Um, you know, nobody in Hollywood saw Thunder Road. Uh, but really, by making the movie to say fuck Hollywood, yeah. I kind of had to make the movie like this. Yeah. So, um, nice. so yeah, we, we tried to make it as like slick as possible. And it looks good. Which are for you the good ingredients to create a good horror comedy movie as this one? Yeah, I mean, Edgar Wright does great stuff, the same kind of thing. Like, I, yeah. I think the best advice that I can give is to do it out loud. Like, really, there are times when I was writing screenplays and I'd be writing in text format, and then the first time somebody would read it out, it would suck. And I'd go, oh no, we gotta shoot this tomorrow, you know? What am I gonna do? Uh, and instead of doing that, you can use a sound recorder and record the script and play different parts and then mix it and edit it and put in music and sound design and really feel the movie and hear it before you show up on set. And so like really, the only reason that any of the jokes work in any of my movies, and he's like very serious movies, is because we've done it before in audio format and I know that that joke is gonna work because I've tried it before. What was the most difficult scene for you to shoot and why? 
the garage scene, at the end of the movie. <laughs> Yeah, we call that scene the mea culpa, like the complete apology. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, that was, so that one, my producers had scheduled it to be about three hours of a shoot. And I said, no, we need, it has to be, we have to be there for eight hours. I have to do this thing and fucking, it's got to be better than Found Right. It's got to be great. Um, yes. And, uh, and it was exhausting. And I went through four suits. They had four identical suits. Yes. And I'm crawling along on the ground, <laughs> fucking up the suits, covered in oil. Uh, it was awful. But really, I hate to say it, the most, the hardest scenes for me to shoot are always the ones that I'm not in. Because I'm the director and I'm watching it, and if it's not working, I can't go over to the person and say, "Just let me do it." You know, like with everything else, I can I can do that kind of. Um, so I think the hardest scene to shoot for this film was probably the scene between uh, uh, Keith and Joy, where it's the wife who poisons the guy with the vape, and then he okay. dies. And yeah. we we shot it in such a way, we had scripted it in such a way to be different. But then in the edit, we made it much more like a Michael Haneke film, uh, where it's just focusing on her, and then you hear him flailing around <laughs> in the background. Anyway. What can you tell us about your collaboration with the composer Jeffrey Campbell Biner on this movie? Yeah, so Jeff Campbell uh, is a buddy of PJ's that he went to school with and was just a wonderful composer. Um, I had not worked with him before, but then we were telling him we wanted it to be like a giallo Italian horror movie, and so he was like, we're sending him all this like harpsichord music and like, you know, really cool sounding spooky Italian music, and he delivered some of it. And then about halfway through the first edit, we started incorporating classical music as well to kind of give it this feel. And then we realized, oh shit, like we might just be using more classical music than Jeff's music and like replacing it with classical stuff. And we just, my, my girlfriend, the post producer, Julia, found this great library of classical music that we had the rights to. And so we just found these perfect Vivaldi moments and slowed them down or sped them up to make them work for the scenes. Um, and then Ben Lovett, who is the composer for The Wolf of Snow Hollow, came in and did the like opening title stuff and things like that. And um, really it was this kind of checkerboard of different composers to help to make the final product. Nice. Have you some words to say in French for uh, all your fans? My father as myself are some big fans of your own work. Uh, mais oui. <laughs> uh, merci. Premier, uh, merci. Uh, et c'est vraiment formidable parce que les Français uh, aiment le film uh, différent comme les Américains. C'est uh, le cinéma, c'est uh, un musée pour, pour, pour lui et. Uh, Et c'est exactement le, le mode que je veux l'audience euh, de voir. Euh, et euh, et c'est vraiment génial et dingue pour moi d'avoir une audience euh, française parce que j'aime beaucoup les films français. C'était euh, ma, ma éducation euh, à l'école, le, le cinéma français. Et, euh, et c'est vraiment... Génial. Alors, et merci. <laughs> Have you already taken to shoot a movie in Paris? And what do you like oh in, in this Paris, in this city? I would Because fucking love <laughs> I know, to I know, shoot I know. a movie. This is my question. <laughs> It's so bad. Uh, so I'm, I'm making, I'm writing a movie right now that takes place in 1890. Okay. Um, and it's supposed to be in Virginia, in America. But driving through Trouville, yes. it's like this looks a bit like it looks a bit like America in the yes. Dutch colonial era, yes. um, and so I don't know. Part of me, it, just from the train ride here 20 minutes ago, to be oh. like, why the fuck am I making movies in America? For? I could be here, you know. After the Deauville American Film Festival, the beta test will be shown in Charles Elysee Film Festival and also Fantastic Fest in Texas that I will cover too. Why can you tell us about the importance of the festivals actually? Yeah, so festivals for me, for two different reasons. The first one is for an audience where they get to watch something that then everybody will see in the next few months. And so they are the most like insane cinephiles that love movies just as much as I do, yes. that care about movies, that get the jokes basically. Yes. You know, they're perverts. <laughs> and I make movies for perverts. And so it's really yes. wonderful to have that um, to have that relationship on like in a in a crowd. I get to like show off a weird movie and people get to see it for the first time. And then for me, as a filmmaker, going to a festival and watching movies really helps me 
to see what the future of artwork will be, yes. and what and it really helps me to to be influenced for my next few movies in a way that going to the library and renting old movies um, doesn't. It's it's it feels like I I'm given permission to make weird stuff every time I see a new movie at a festival. Can you talk a little about your Twitter sessions that I follow? Yeah, sure. So <laughs> it's a good I've idea. Been, yeah, it's a really sure. good idea. I think. Oh, okay, cool, yes. cool, cool. Good. Um, yes, I'm glad it's helpful. Uh, yeah, so I started doing these Twitter spaces where I just help filmmakers who have a problem with their movie. So much of my life has been having phone calls or emails with filmmakers who are stuck and they can't figure out a way to make something work. And so there are times for the last five years where I would respond to an email and that person would say, thank you, the problem solved, thank you for doing that. But it would just die with that person. So that piece of advice doesn't, nobody else hears it. And so I thought, okay, well, I have a big enough Twitter following now that I can do a Twitter spaces and then speak to 400 people at once. And it becomes helping the entire community instead of just yes. a specific filmmaker who has the balls to reach out to me. It's nice. I mean, I was so timid when I was starting out. I didn't, I didn't, I, I was too nervous to ask questions. And that's why I failed for so long. And so it feels really good to be able to help and send the ladder back down. It's a great idea. <laughs> and my last question, which are your current projects? Yeah. So, uh, right now we're going out for a TV show about astronauts coming back to Earth and living in Florida, uh, which is very funny and poignant and sad. Um, and then we just wrote another a feature about a YouTube journalist uh, in America, and it's very funny and could be really beautiful. And then I'm doing a movie uh, called The Current uh, that I'm writing that's about 1890 uh, in America and this like really beautiful interracial friendship um, during that time and yeah I really am very excited about that one. Thank you Jim. Can I take a picture? Yes of course. Can I ask you an autograph for me for my private? Of course. <laughs> Thank you.